Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. It's October 15, 2021, and today we're bringing you a syndicated episode from the Asia Research News podcast. This podcast is on gender and conflict, in particular on women in the anti-coup resistance movement in Myanmar and how women's rights are tightly connected to democracy activism in the country. Now, without further ado, I'll let Stephen Dale take it over and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Women have played a leading role in the protests, which erupted after Myanmar's military seized power on February the 1st and ousted Aung San Suu Kyi and other elected leaders. The 2021 military coup in Myanmar has been met with widespread and fierce public opposition, and at the forefront of this resistance are women. Women have been highly visible and vocal at national protests. They have taken on key roles within Myanmar's civil disobedience movement. They have used their influence as government workers, as teachers, social workers, health care providers, and so forth, and within their families. And they've done these things at significant personal risk. Many of the women who have taken to the streets have given their lives to protect Myanmar's fragile democracy. And I mean, we want a democratic society where there are guarantee of equity, equality, freedom from want, freedom from fear. We can now have higher expectations in having political impact and decision-making during the democratic period, and Myanmar women will not turn back. My name is Stephen Dale, and this is an Asia Research News podcast. In this podcast, we'll look at why the desire for democracy and the fight for women's equality have been so tightly bound together. We'll try to shed some light on that question by looking at the findings of researchers working with Knowledge for Democracy Myanmar, an initiative of Canada's International Development Research Centre. Local researchers worked in partnership with international collaborators looking at the impacts of gender inequality on both women and men, and on society in general. They examined how conflict and gender roles intersect, how war has distinct impacts on women and men, how traditional gender roles skew the labor market and make economic rebuilding more difficult. A word of warning, later in this podcast there will be discussion of some disturbing issues such as violence against women and the use of rape as a weapon of war. Please don't continue listening if you find these topics too upsetting. First, let's consider the general conditions that women and men in Myanmar have been living under. Like many other countries around the globe, Myanmar is a place where women and men are not on an equal footing. I am Mesa Bepu, uh, the director with Gender Equality Network, which includes more than 100 local NGOs and civil society organizations. I am also representing Women Advocacy Coalition Myanmar, a coalition of four key networks working for women's rights and gender equality. Yeah, I grew up in a very patriarchal society. I myself experienced a lot of discriminations and inequalities. I grew up in Kachin, uh, which is uh, one of the minority ethnic groups in Myanmar. And our Kachin society is very much male-dominated and some uh, preference society. So like uh, only son (laughs) could carry our family's names and inheritance from their parents. Being a woman, you know, you have no no rights. You have no rights to say your opinion in the public or in the family. It was working in remote rural communities that May Sabe Piu saw how these gender roles shape the world women must live in. When I started working as a primary health care workers, 
and engage with women and girls living in different ethnic rural areas. I kept seeing, you know, the same stories and the same experiences. Whenever we are talking about sexual and reproductive health, women usually they don't have power to negotiate when they will have a child or what she needs to eat, you know, like <laughs> or everything. Women are not having power of negotiation, not only to their spouse, but also, you know, within the family. I'm fully respectful for the lovely culture we have. But if the society is practicing some of the cultural practices and social norms that impact negatively on women and girls' life, we have to think twice because there are a lot of harmful social practices like forced marriage, the, the issue of dowry, right? Her growing awareness of the disadvantages faced by many of Myanmar's women led May Sabe Piu to join the country's women's movement. The network she now represents came to prominence in the wake of Cyclone Nargis in 2008. So Gender Equality Network, uh, Jen, was born out of the need to address the needs of affected women and girls in humanitarian crisis in Myanmar. Uh, in May 2008, when Myanmar was hit by the most devastating cyclone Nagis. And Myanmar then was ruled by the military gender that barred all humanitarian access to affected areas. And it was a group of like-minded women leaders who led the movement of providing relief goods and emergency medical assistance, you know, especially to women and girls, HIV-infected and pregnant women. Besides restrictive gender roles and periodic natural disasters, women in Myanmar have faced another daunting challenge, war. Advancing economically, getting an education, going to work without fear of violence, doing any of these things has been made much more difficult by conditions created by conflict. Alexandre Pelletier is a senior researcher with the University of Toronto's Post-Conflict Reintegration Laboratory, and he collaborated with the Knowledge for Democracy Myanmar initiative. He says conflict and gender roles interact with each other in ways that make the challenges facing women more intractable. Together, these factors create economic barriers for women during the actual conflict, as well as in the post-conflict period. To begin to understand the, the impact of war or conflict or post-conflict environments on women, we need to understand how the imbalance in the, in the terrain already plays out in the first place, right? There's already large gender imbalance in access to work in Myanmar, and Myanmar is not unique in that respect, right? The labor market in Myanmar is already extremely gendered, and women participation is extremely low in comparison to other countries in the region. So war tend to exacerbate those gender imbalance. And there are many reasons why Myanmar stands out a little bit in terms of low women participation. But war is certainly not a stranger to that situation in some regions, uh, not every region, of course. In terms of gender norms, lots of gender norms prevent women from taking on jobs that are too physical or too hard, for example. So as a result, women tend to be overrepresented in the informal economy and most of the time confined to unpaid, underpaid, and precarious form of informal or social reproductive work. So this means that they are unpaid or unacknowledged labor in the community. They take care of cooking, cleaning of the family, caretaking responsibilities, but they generally remain uh, confined to those areas. So what happens in Myanmar is that in some regions that are post-conflict, there there's been some major development projects in rural areas that have kind of reinforce those norms, the gender division of labor, because they have pushed men into migration. So major development project has brought labor from some regions of Myanmar into others to work in, for example, uh, could be road construction, bridge construction, or dam construction, for example. And, and migration has basically emptied some village of their men, which has forced women into increasing caretaking responsibilities in some uh, areas. Both men and women suffer because of war, but the form of their suffering is often different. <laughs> 
I'm Ismini Gizelis, and I'm a professor in the Department of Government at the University of Essex. My research is on uh, post-conflict reconstruction and gender equality. When it comes to what we call intrastate conflicts, like within the state, uh, civil wars, that they're the most common currently, men often are the first victims because men get fight. <laughs> or they're more involved in the fighting, although you do have cases where women also are fighters. But especially in the post-conflict setting, the way that resources, productive resources, move away from areas such as health or education exposes women to different types of vulnerabilities. Both boys and girls will have a disrupted educational experience, but for girls it may be more dangerous to reach an educational establishment. And that, of course, means fewer opportunities in life, illiteracy, the kind of employment they can achieve later on is limited, their ability to engage with economic activities is limited, their ability to express their opinion in different settings is limited, and therefore that creates again, uh, negative implications for them, their families and their communities. Women and men have also experienced displacement as a result of war. Often they wind up in internally displaced people's camps or IDP camps. But these circumstances can also impact men and women quite differently. One of the consequences of war is that it displaces people. Lots of people live in IDP camps, and IDP camps are not exactly the most secure areas for women, especially since some of these camps are affected by an epidemic of drug and drug abuse, which mostly affect men. And this is another differentiated impact of war on men and women, is that men experience war firsthand most of the time. So they, they are involved as soldiers or uh, as porters, or so they are involved physically and personally in the war. So they live through, through important trauma, for example. When they are at home and they cannot provide for their family, they often go through uh, lots of mental health issues that are not addressed in Myanmar. So one of the ways of addressing those mental health issues is abuse of drugs. And drugs are extremely available in Myanmar. Myanmar is formerly known as the Golden Triangle, you know, parts of Myanmar, so areas of drug production, heroin production, but also nowadays chemical drug production. So men are affected by that. And in the meantime, women are experiencing that in a different way. Uh, they become often victim of violence, of partner intimate violence or sexual violence. So that's one way the experience of living in camps affect women particularly uh, in this case. But also living in camps make them extremely vulnerable to human trafficking as well. And that's another problem we observed in, the, in our research, is that human trafficking is rampant in some of those camps. That's something we've seen a lot. Women have also been the direct targets of military campaigns. Alexandre Pelletier. They've experienced the harsh counterinsurgency campaigns by the Tatmadaw, Myanmar's national army, as we've seen in the case of the Rohingya minority in uh, Rakhine state, for example, where entire villages have been burned down and women have been raped by the military as a weapon of war. And that has been documented by the United Nations Independent Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar that sexual crimes have been used by the Tatmadaw as a weapon of war. Although the global you know, media attention has been mostly toward uh, Rohingya, the report actually finds similar situation in Shan state and Kachin state, where the Tatmada regularly uses uh, rape as a weapon of war because it demoralizes local community. It also destroys families and, and communities. But in the face of these horrors, women in Myanmar have not just stood by. Even as war has subjected women to danger and violence, Many have risen up and attempted to rewrite their story. Ismeni Gazelis says the multiple threats facing women in conflict zones cannot be ignored, but neither can the opportunities for change that sometimes emerge in the midst of upheaval. A lot of landmines are in fields, so they disproportionately impact women. 70% of casualties of landmines are women who work in the fields. Landmines, even if they don't kill you, the kind of <laughs> injuries are detrimental to their well-being for whole life and it impacts also their families again. 
and their communities. Working in markets, it's another area where women and those can be disrupted by conflict. On the other hand, there is also an observation that conflicts can create opportunities for women under certain conditions. So women, especially if there is a history of women's organizations in the country, they also can use conflict as an opportunity to mobilize and demand more resources. And therefore, it can also lead to more political participation, for instance. So it's not, it can have on the one hand very severe implications, on the other hand, create opportunities. The question is whether the conditions in a country are such that will support these new opportunities new uh, for women to take on new roles. It's not just political participating in organizations. Very often women perform a lot of activities because men are afraid to go out, for example. So they will trade goods in order to sustain their family. And that gives them new experiences and new confidence and their ability to engage in different networks. In Myanmar, the 10-year period of democratization, which ended with the 2021 military coup, brought some strides towards greater gender equality. One example is the reform of police departments. Min Zhao is director of the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security. When they consider making plans, there was very little consideration of women. But the change after 2011, and we see a significant number of women recruited to the police force. And in a lot of police stations, they started thinking about uh, how to handle the cases where women involved uh, differently than the men. So this type of considerations emerge. But when it comes to implementation, they, they have a lot of uh, long way for them to move forward to consider uh, uh, the gender sensitivity. Do we see improvement? Yes, but it is still far from what we want to see uh, by the international standard. Alexandre Pelletier was also involved in the research into police reform. One interesting thing, in the police, we looked at the police sector. Uh, women went from 4% to 20% of the total police forces. That's very impressive, because when you look at Bangladesh, it's only about 3%, Indonesia, it's 35 Thailand six, Malaysia, 12. So with 20%, it's closer to New Zealand and the United Kingdom than it is to neighboring countries. But the problem is that women in those police forces are reserved to lower level roles, generally traffic police. They're not given decision-making power or position. So it, it looks good from the outside, but it doesn't really change the culture of the institution from inside. In our survey data, we, we asked women, how confident do you feel going to the police if you are a victim of a crime? And women were not very confident uh, of going to the police. And the interesting thing is that they were less confident of going to the police when they were a victim of sexual crimes than when they were a victim of other crimes, such as robbery. Also during this period of democracy, researchers started looking at the potential for instituting a form of gender budgeting in Myanmar. This project was a collaboration between international researchers and the Myanmar Institute for Gender Studies. Gender budgeting is a tool to improve women's position in society, and it's based on a very simple concept – says Ismini Gazelis. It goes back to the old definition of what is political science, and that is who gets what, when, and how. So how things are allocated. And in Myanmar, government spending has been allocated unevenly. One of the big questions that determines how much you benefit from the way government spends its money is whether you live in an urban or a rural area. I born in city. That is why I have full access to education, right? I don't need to spend three or four hours for fetching water. 
or fetching firewood like the women and girls uh, used to do in the rural areas, right? Because in cities, we have better electricity, transportation, right? And you, you have better access to education or livelihood opportunities. But if you are born and live in the rural areas, you know, because our country, more than 70% of populations live in rural area, and most of the rural area are still undeveloped. The transportation or access to information, you know, everything is limited. There are many other countries where similar conditions exist where rural areas receive fewer resources than urban areas, where men and women play different economic roles. Studies in those places show that men and women will have different preferences for government spending, at least most of the time. There were more recently uh, studies in sub-Saharan Africa and India where they found that in many areas where women had to, for example, fetch water, they preferred to have more resources allocated towards uh, building uh, sanitation projects or building facilities to make, obviously, uh, uh, access to drinking water uh, easier. But they also, there was also evidence that uh, as soon as the women had the same kind of employment opportunities are, as men, there were no differences in their preferences. Myanmar has one of the lowest rates of tax collection in the world but it also has a lot of resources. And there are other characteristics that suggest it could serve women in poor, remote areas better, that it could spend more to improve their lives. The way that Myanmar is unique in some ways is that it doesn't have the state collapse that you might observe in other countries that are post-conflict. And therefore, it is a bit surprising that it has the low ability, the central, the union, to actually collect taxes in order to distribute more resources and reach out to the, to the ordinary citizens. In the gender budgeting study in Myanmar, the researchers provided men and women in rural areas across the country with information on what percentage of the national budget is spent on which activities. They asked these citizens about their spending preferences. The respondents couldn't increase the overall budget, but they could move spending from one category to another. And what did most people decide to cut? So the key one is defense, where you can see that all of them, they wanted to reduce spending on defense. However, there were differences between men and women. Both men and women wanted to reduce it, but women want to reduce it less than men. Again, I want to reiterate that both men and women wanted to reduce defense spending. It's just men wanted to reduce it by a larger amount than women. Where did the respondents want to increase spending? There was one surprise. Rural women without electricity did not favor the government spending more on electricity production. Apparently, they felt that having access to electricity would not improve their lives. For the most part, however, the results were in line with what the researchers expected. It was clear education and health that were the two areas where there was a stronger preference. In the case of education, it was cutting across the level of education of the people who were responding. Health is the one area that clearly both men and women, especially women, would like funds to be reallocated. And that's consistent, again, with the vulnerabilities that women experience especially in a post-conflict countries where the institution's um, access to health is not equitably distributed uh, or is very expensive. Here's an interesting footnote. Although the researchers tracked the response of men and women separately, they were not allowed to call this a gender budgeting study. The word gender, apparently, was regarded by some officials as taboo. The issue of gender was controversial even before we started research. So there was a resistance and we had to, before we get approval to start the research, we had to change the title and remove the gender work. So it seems that gender is something that at least some segments of the bureaucratic and political structure at the time were treating with skepticism. But ironically, not calling this a gender budgeting study actually highlights one of the deeper truths about efforts to incorporate women's priorities into government policy. That is, the benefits of this exercise do not just benefit women, 
Instead, gender budgeting and similar measures have broad, positive impacts across society. One way forward is to emph- emphasize the importance that gender budgeting has for development. So this is not just about women versus men. This is about the kind of development, the trajectories of development you can have long term. All countries slowly develop, but the quality of trajectories that you have are different depending on whether institutions are more inclusive and whether women are more involved in the process. And the benefits of considering gender is not just limited to economic gains. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Ismene Gazelis describes a kind of virtuous cycle where greater equality for women can reduce social tensions and increase security, thereby creating the conditions for economic growth. So there are studies, especially macro-level studies, that look long-term trajectories. We're talking about 20, 30 years where changes in um, gender inclusion, improved conditions for women, together with improvements in education, have much stronger effects in uh, opening up institutions, less corruption, and therefore lead to growth that is more inclusive and they're more responsive to their needs, mitigating conflicts and therefore leading to more overall security and opportunities for uh, economic activities to thrive. Improving gender equality can lead to better economic development overall. So that's one optimistic long-range possibility. Respecting women's rights will foster peace, and stimulate inclusive economic growth. In today's Myanmar, however, such optimistic scenarios seem starkly at odds with the current reality. Rather than respect for women's rights improving social conditions, deteriorating conditions seem to be further threatening the position of women. For example, May Sabe Piu says persistent conflict continues to reinforce harmful practices like child marriage. I mean, Myanmar women have been adversely impacted by six or seven decades of armed conflict and mostly in ethnic areas, right? And because of the conflict, because of uh, lack of security, you know, women and girls, they are not access to education, they are not access to work. And even they are routine day to go to their farm or gardens, it's always uh, risks involved, right? I mean, you can be targeted for the sexual violence or rape, or you can be the victim of landmines. And because of all these insecurities, usually uh, parents, they will force uh, girls to get married early so that they will be protected by a man, right? Current forms of economic development are also working against equality and inclusiveness, says Alexandre Pelletier. A lot of development in the region, especially in the in the periphery of the country where ethnic minorities are located. So there's been economic development, building of roads, building of airports, building of natural resources extraction, agriculture. There's been economic development in the last decade. That's 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 great. But that economic development is not necessarily inclusive. <laughs> and that's one problem. It's not inclusive because sometimes it's basically people from central Myanmar, sometimes from neighboring countries that come in and exploit some of those natural resources. So there's lots of stories of land grabbing by actors from the central government or business actors from the center. Uh, and, and that too has lots of impact on women because women are often not recognized as household heads and they don't have title to land. Although they have legal right to own land in Myanmar, most of the time titles to land are not given to women. So imagine in a post-conflict community where you've been displaced, you're going back to your community, you don't have papers to prove that this land belongs to you and there's a big company that comes in that wants to do mono cropping of something or use the land for something else it's very difficult sir for some of those families and especially women to prove that they own the land what we've seen a lot in our research is also that some companies have brought 
uh, laborers from other regions. So local population are seeing development happening in their region, but they're not benefiting from development. So that's, again, it's going to be fueling grievances rather than taming grievances in the future if, if development continues that way. Getting to a better tomorrow will require resolving some fundamental issues. I think the core of the issue is political. Without the political question settled, uh, there's little hope for peace. And I think that's what we've learned in the last 50 years, is that without political settlement, there, there's little hope for true, genuine peace in Myanmar. Hope for gender equality, women's empowerment, and equal society. It could not be happen under the military rules, you know, democratic principles and right-based approach could survive only under the democratic civilian government. That's how we believe. So there are so much barriers and so much to do still. Knowledge for Democracy Myanmar is a joint initiative of Canada's International Development Research Centre and Global Affairs Canada. Its purpose is to support public policy research in Myanmar. This podcast is produced by Asia Research News. I'm Stephen Dale. Thanks for listening.